Hi everyone, um, not everyone's here. It's the last day of term. Uh, you've been set your holiday work, which is to do with uh, magnetic fields and magnetic forces and induction. Um, rather than just set you on the work and then go off and sun myself on a beach somewhere, what I've done, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to introduce the topic to you. I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour of as much of it as I possibly can in the space of 45 minutes. Um, if you need to ask questions, please ask questions, but otherwise, um, uh, please watch the video and obviously it's on my YouTube channel you can watch it again uh, anytime you like as long as you've got YouTube access but as per normal with retransfer you've only got the file for about a month for about a week so make sure you get it downloaded if you don't if you live in a country where you can't access YouTube um, so we're looking at magnetic fields I'm going to take you through a bit of a PowerPoint presentation sorry about that I, I, I don't normally like doing presentations because I tend to find the get a tiny bit boring but then I'm quite a boring person anyway, so uh, I'm, I'm, sure you, I'm sure there won't be much difference. So um, we're starting off with magnetic fields. Oops, sorry, hang on. I'm just going to change that. I'm just going to ch share my screen. So we're starting off with magnetic fields. And it's, this is basically an introduction. Um, so we start off with the idea of what a field is. A field is a physical quantity that has a value for each point in space and time. Well, what's that? Well, a field is an area, an area which is not in contact with anything, but a force can still be felt. So you've looked at gravitational fields and you've looked at electric fields. And if you think about it, a gravitational field doesn't require contact. It, you can you still experience the force of gravity your own weight, even if you're in midair, and that's why you accelerate downwards due to gravity. So it's an area where a force can be experienced. And just like with electric and, magnetic, uh, electric and gravitational fields, magnetic fields follow very similar rules. So for example, you've got a fairly nasty looking uh, magnetic field there. You've got your field lines and they show the direction of a force. Now in a magnetic field line, it shows the direction of force on a north magnetic pole. Now you can't actually get a north magnetic pole on its own. You have, with every north there has to be a south, it's just the way it is. Uh, but if you could, that would be the direction of the force. Okay, so they tell you uh, a lot about the force, they tell you the direction. And just like with gravitational forces and electrical forces, the density of those field lines tells you how strong the field is. So for example, on my little, um, on my little demonstration here, you've got, your, um, you've got your field lines close together here, so you've got a strong magnetic field. Here, the force lines, the field lines are further apart. So it's a weaker magnetic field. And that's the basic idea. The same thing happens with my simulation. Now I'm just gonna to switch to a, a proper simulation here. There we are. And this is roughly what my simulation looks like. I've got a bar magnet, which I could move about. And I've got a compass. Now I've also set it up so that, um, so that I can actually show you the field. We start with a compass. Now this red end of the compass is basically the north end of a magnet. The white end here is the south end of the magnet. So this compass, the north, is being attracted to the south. And the south on here is being repelled from the south. So it shows, that it shows basically the direction of the magnetic field in any in in location. So if I move my compass to up here again, We've got the um, the north pole of the of the compass being attracted to the south pole. Same thing happens with planet Earth. If we've got planet Earth here, if you're on the surface of Earth, say in Australia, then obviously your south your south pole here would be seeking the south pole of the Earth. Inside the Earth, in the core, there is of course a magnetic field. And conscious of what people think. At the moment, the north, the magnetic south pole of the Earth is actually the north pole of a magnet. If we think about it, we could think of it as the south seeking pole, the south seeker. So the south here is seeking the south of um, the south pole of the Earth. And anywhere you are, you can tell the, uh, the direction of, north, of magnetic north simply by using a compass. I should note that actually, on Earth, the magnetic field actually swaps, so it, it changes, it goes stronger and weaker all the time. 
sometimes it uh, actually reverses polarity. And in fact, the Earth is actually due a reversing reversal of polarity. But that's a whole other story. So let's go back to our magnet. So a magnet always gives a magnetic field. So if I show the field and take the compass away, you can see that it follows a, cer a certain set of uh, patterns. Now, if we follow those, you could actually draw field lines, which I'm going to do in just a moment. Um, but that is the basic pattern for the magnetic field from a static bar magnet. So if I now stop my share and I go across to my desk camera, There are lots of different magnetic fields and they follow the same rules as electric fields. So for example, we know that with a compass, I'll just change my black pen if I've got it. No, I'll put it down somewhere. If you've got a north pole of a compass and a south pole of a compass, a magnet rather, then the field lines follow the same rules as you would do if you had a plus and a minus charge. They would, act, they would actually be an attraction that way, okay? Now, the same thing happens with a magnet. It's exactly the same. They're continuous lines going from north to south. Looking something like that. Now, if you've got any kind of other magnet here, if you've got a horseshoe magnet, you can actually make two parallel magnetic poles. And you end up with parallel magnetic field lines. Okay? And so you can actually follow exactly the same rules as you would have with electric fields. One of the things I love about physics is that it all follows, that everything in physics seems to follow patterns. So once you know how one thing works, you can, you can often uh, work out how other things, possibly everything works. It's quite interesting. So that's the basic idea behind mag magnetic fields. Now, if we go beyond that, Bear with me, wrong, wrong one. There we are. If we go beyond that, we start to look at what happens when a current flows through a wire. If you have a current flowing through a wire, it will actually generate its own magnetic field. So for example, on this particular, on this particular example here, you've got a current carrying wire. Now, the way you'd look at it, and I've deliberately left my camera on here on, on the desk camera, the way you actually work out the direction of that magnetic field is you imagine your thumb, you get your right hand, not your left, okay? You imagine your thumb is showing the direction of the current, okay? Your fingers would show the direction of the magnetic field. So if ever you get a question where you've got a current carrying wire and you have to predict the uh, magnetic field around that current carrying wire, you can simply do that by showing your wire with your current flowing through it okay and the magnetic field is a series of concentric circles and really and truly what we should try to do is have the field lines getting further apart as you sort of move away from the wire because we think about it we would expect the magnetic field to weaken but to show the direction of that current, of, of that magnetic field, you use your right hand grip. So the current's going that way, so the field is going round this way at right angles. Like that on, on, on my screen. I'm not sure if you can see that terribly clearly. If I stop share, I can show you again. There. So imagine you've got a current carrying wire there with the current flowing that way. Right hand grip rule. Okay, so if you're gripping something, right hand grip rule shows the magnetic field circulating, in this case, anti-clockwise. If the current's reversed, the magnetic field goes around the other way. So we can start to predict the behavior of, um, of the magnetic field being produced. Now, if we think about it, if you, if you take that 
and you add more wires, all with current flowing the same way, these magnetic fields kind of add together. So they start to go round like that. Or to put it another way, if you take that, well, the, the, the way that that would work is you would, to get all the wire, to get all the current flowing the same way in the wire, what you would do is you would essentially coil the wire. You make what's called a solenoid. So it's a coil of wire. If you have a coil of wire, And currents flowing that way. So if that's the bit that's sorry, if that's the bit that's towards you, and this bit is away from you, the current is going that way. Okay, so the magnetic field is circulating that way around the wire, around around the solenoid, and therefore, I'm going to get this right. That goes behind. I'm just making the gaps there to make it obvious. Okay. And it would go around that way. And if we think about it going around the back of the wire, it would do exactly the same. In the back of the solenoid there, it would do exactly the same. This time, still be going that way, so that would still be that way. And our magnetic field starts to take shape. And what we end up with is this pattern here. And if you think about it, that pattern, that magnetic field pattern is remarkably similar to, on the small screen, to the magnetic field around a bar magnet, okay? Now, what affects the, um, the strength of this magnetic field? Well, it's fairly logical. If you have more turns on your coil, so your coil of wire here has more turns on it, each magnetic field is gonna reinforce each other so you'll have a stronger magnetic field. If you increase the current through the wire, I think it stands to reason that you would increase the magnetic field again. So current and the number of turns on the coil. The other thing that affects the um, magnetic field strength, the strength of that magnetic field, would be if you put something inside that coil of wire, which, uh, which, could, which would be easily magnetized, like a piece of iron. So putting iron in there actually aligns all the atoms so that all the north poles of each, of each iron atom are sort of all pointing the same way and reinforcing each other, and you make an even stronger magnetic field. And that's why electromagnets need an iron, what we call a core, an iron core. Right, let's move on. Now, if you take a current carrying wire and you pass a current through it, you know that you'll generate a magnetic field. And if you put two magnetic fields together, they'll interfere, they'll add together. There'll be a force between the, magnet, between the two things causing the magnetic field, whether it's the North Pole and the North Pole of a magnet, or whether, it's, or whether it's a wire in a magnetic field. And you can predict the direction of that force simply by looking at the, um, but simply by knowing the direction of the current and knowing the direction of the magnetic field. So to demonstrate that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go off my share again, and I'm going to show you what's called Fleming's left-hand rule. So we've done the right-hand grip rule. This rule is for the direction of force on a current carrying wire, and later on, You'll, work, you'll realize that this is how motors work. And as mild physics teacher used to say, you drive your motor on the left-hand side of the road. Obviously that, that works in Britain and Australia and New Zealand, maybe not quite so well in some other countries. So the way it works is you take your right hand, okay? Now, first of all, you point with your finger. I know in some cultures it's rude, but we're gonna do that, okay? First finger begins with an F, first finger. So the first finger begins with F and so does field. So the first finger shows the direction of a magnetic field. Your second finger is at right angles, okay? So it looks something like that, okay? 
Now the second finger, it's got a C in it. A bit tenuous, but this does work. And it shows the direction of current going from positive to negative. So my second finger is showing current to you. It's going off to your left, okay? So it's going from right to left. Your first finger's directly upwards. Now the, the force is at right angles. So right angles to both of those. So that's your thumb. And your thumb, they said M, because thumb's got an M in it, um, and that shows direction of motion. Well, actually, it shows direction of force. Another word for force is thrust. So thumb is the direction of the thrust. First finger field, second finger current, thumb thrust, okay? So if I've got a magnetic field going towards you, and the current is going from right to left, then the force on the wire carrying that current is in the direction of my thumb, which is upwards, okay? So first finger field, second finger current, thumb thrust. Now, if you want to change the direction of that thrust, there are two things you can change. You can change the direction of the current, and the thrust is reversed. Or you can change the direction of the field. It points towards me, current's in that direction. So again, it, it's, re hang on, current is in that direction. Yeah. And it's, so first finger field is towards me, second finger still the same direction. Now the thrust is down again, okay? There's an old joke I always make that you can always tell if you're supervising a physics exam, there's a question on the left, on Fleming's left hand rule, because all the students put their pens down and suddenly start going like this. Okay, um, it's, it's something that, that makes me laugh every time I supervise a physics test. Um, so, moving on, as I'm sure you wish I would. Uh, that tells you, that tells you the direction. To work out the magnitude, it's very simple. You'll find this out when you do your reading. The strength of the force on that wire is equal to the magnetic flux density, so that's the same thing as the magnetic field strength, times the current, times the length. Well, that makes sense. If you've got a wire in a magnetic field, a current carrying wire, if you put it in a stronger magnetic field, you'll feel a stronger magnetic force. Well, that's logical. If you increase the current through the wire, well, the, current, the magnetic field created by the wire is going to be stronger. So you're going to feel an increased force. That makes sense. And if you've got a longer piece of wire in that magnetic field at right angles to it, well, if you think about it, if you've got one piece of wire providing a force upwards, you take another piece of wire and you apply that one with a force upwards, the two forces are going to push together. So you're going to increase the force. So again, it's actually obvious. A good way to remember this one, though, is I call it Bill. F equals Bill, B-I-L. B for magnetic flux density or magnetic field strength. I for current and L for length of wire in the field. But they all, it's only works so far if they are at right angles to each other. Okay. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about magnetic flux density. We're going to come across it uh, towards the end of this particular sort of introduction lesson. The basic idea about magnetic flux density is it's the strength of a field. It's the number of field lines per unit area, okay? So we think about it when we're talking about fields, you know the closer together lines are, field lines are, the stronger the field is. Well, if you imagine you've got all your field lines, let's say you've got four field lines, and they're within an area, the more field lines within that area there are, the denser, the closer together all the field lines must be, and therefore the stronger the magnetic field is. You'll learn a bit more about that fairly shortly. Now, if we've got a current in a wire, going from, say, say we've got magnetic fields going from north to south, and we've got three amps flowing through the wire, you can actually work out the force on the wire, okay? Okay, it's pretty simple. It only starts to go a little bit wrong when you don't have the length of wire all, all being sort of perpendicular to the field. So what actually happens here is F equals BIL works if the field and the current are at right angles to each other. Here, if it's not, same length of wire, 
it, you have to put in a factor of sine theta, okay? Now, if you think about it, that actually makes sense because if we're looking at the components of the length of wire that is at right angles to the field, that's going to be the opposite angle on a right angle triangle. So it makes sense that actually it's F equals current times magnetic flux density times length times the sine of the angle between the magnetic field and the wire or the current, or the current carrier. So of course it can work on strings of electrons. If that's the case, then as this wire rotates, well here it's 90 degrees. The sine of 90 degrees is just one, so it just disappears in, in the formula. As it rotates, once you've got the wire in the same direction as a the magnetic field, that theta is zero. The sine of zero is zero, so there's no force. Well, if you think about it, if that wire is infinitely thin, then there would be no components at right angles to the magnetic field. So that actually does make logical sense. Same thing happens with charges in the magnetic field. Now, I think this is going to have gone slightly wrong in the translation here. But if you think about it, if we think about a proton moving in a magnetic field, and I'm going to show you this using the fingers and cameras. So bear with me. If you've got a proton moving from left to right, so there is your proton, yeah? It's moving that way. If you've got a magnetic field towards you, you've essentially got a moving charge. Moving charge, that's current. So, if you've got a proton, it's, the, it's, the, it's a positive charge, it's moving that way, your current is in that direction, okay? Magnetic fields towards you, it would experience a force downwards. The magnetic field, was, if you've got the current going that way and the field's towards you, it, it experiences an upwards force. Now, it's always at right angles to the direction of the current. That force is always at right angles to the current. So what will happen? Well, the proton will, will change direction and experience a new force, still at right angles, and experience a new force, always at right angles, to the, to, the vec to the velocity vector. Where have you seen that before? Circular motion. So any charged particle moving in a magnetic field will move in a circle. And I'm actually going to skip the slide on this one and show you on, on, on paper because I think it's easier if I actually sort of draw it rather than uh, just show you a static slide and, and talk at you. So if you imagine you've got a positive charge here moving in a magnetic field, well, I'm going to have to start showing you some of the conventions here. It's really hard. This is a three-dimensional situation. When you're trying to show a three-dimensional situation in two dimensions, it's a bit of a nightmare. So what we do is we use a little trick. I'm going to show the magnetic flux going into the paper. And the way we show that is we use crosses in circles. So if you see that with a B next to it to show the magnetic field, that means it's a magnetic field moving away from you. The way to think about that is if you've, is if you've got a dart. Somebody throws a dart. Whoops, oh dear. That looks a little bit like a dart, it looks more like a rocket, but never mind. If you've got a dart, it's moving in that direction, yeah? If you're looking at the dart from this, from this side, what you see is the tail fins. So you would see the tail fins, you'd see the dart moving away from you. If you're looking at the dart from this side, what you'd see is the body of the dart and the, and the point coming towards you. Obviously, this person is in dire danger. They, they're going to have to duck. But the point is, you see what I said there? The point? Ha -ha. Right. Uh, the point is that if you see a magnetic field and it shows a circle with a dot in the middle, that means it's coming towards you. That means a magnetic field out of the paper coming towards you. If you see a circle with a cross in it, that means a magnetic field moving away from you. So let's go back to the main bit of physics here. So at the moment, if we, if we imagine our magnetic field is in here, somehow it magically switches on and off. So it's magically off as the proton positive charge goes into the magnetic field. It will immediately feel a force. Fleming's left-hand rule to the rescue, fields towards you, 
currents in that direction. So the force, the force is going to be downwards. So it will suddenly experience a force downwards. So it will move in a circular path with the, fit, the force always at right angles, okay? Now, that force on that current carrying wire, sorry, on that moving charge, is the same as B times Q times V, okay? And that's a formula you're gonna have to know about. That is B, is the magnetic flux density or the magnetic field strength. Q is the charge on the current, on the, uh, on the particle. V is the velocity of the particle. <clears throat> so if we think about it, we can even make some predictions. Well, if F equals B, Q, V, that, if that's moving in a circle, then that force is a centripetal force, which is M, V squared over R. So we've got B, Q, the V cancels with the V squared there, equals MV over R. So you can work out, you can actually work out the radius of the circle if you know the charge and the mass. And actually, you can start playing with various ideas here, and you can start to, um, you can start to actually make some assumptions about, um, about the, charge, uh, the charge to mass ratio. So if you think about it, if you've got, if you want to work out the charge to mass ratio, the specific charge on a particle, yeah, you'd have to do divide both sides by M, divide both sides by B, and so you end up with V over B, sorry, V not V squared, over B R. Okay. Now, if you think about it, if you've got lots of particles all moving at the same velocity, then that radius of the circle gives you the charge to mass ratio. And that's actually really good in mass spectrometers if you um, if if you want to separate out different isotopes. Because if you think about it, if you've got say carbon twelve and carbon fourteen, if we think about it, if you ionise that carbon by stripping an electron away, this one they're both of the same charge, but this carbon's got a greater mass, so it has a lower charge to mass ratio. So if they're moving through the same magnetic field, this one will have, well, if it's got a lower charge to mass ratio, it'll have a larger radius. So you can actually start to think, well, if, if you imagine that's your carbon 12, your carbon 14 would actually move in a less tight circle. And so because of that, you can then separate out different isotopes. And that's how come we know things like uh, how what percentage of natural carbon is carbon 14 and what percentage is carbon 12. We know that because we can separate them out using a thing called a mass spectrometer. If you study chemistry, ask your chemistry teacher about mass spectrometers and uh, yeah, they'll tell you lots, okay? Very, very important bit of, uh, bit of physics, application of physics. Right, let's move on. Now, as I said, I'm probably going to skip some of this. So we need to look a little bit, a little bit more detail now at um, magnetic flux and magnetic flux density. Bear with me. I'm just going to change my camera so you can see my face. It'll keep the small children away. There we are. So if you imagine, if you think about it, we need to start to look at what magnetic flux and flux linkage is. Because again, I did promise you uh, a bit of, a, a bit of um, an introduction to this. If we think about it, magnetic flux is the total amount of magnetism, okay? So magnetic flux density is the number, is the density of the magnetic field. So if we think about it, if we've got a magnetic field going from left to right, let's say, so our four magnetic field lines. The magnetic flux would say there are four of these field lines, okay? But if we're looking at the magnetic flux per square meter or per unit area, let's say we've got a unit area being the sort of the, the gap in my, in my hand there. If we think about it, we've only got two magnetic field lines will actually fit. So that would be the density of the field lines. So the magnetic flux tells you how much magnetism is within an area. The magnetic flux density tells you the density of that magnetic field and therefore the strength of the magnetic field. 
Now we also come across a thing called magnetic flux linkage, which is the magnetic flux, but it's multiplied by the number of turns within a coil. Okay, so if you imagine you've got a coil of wire, if you've got a coil of wire with say two turns, so the wire's just, just turned around twice, then the magnetic flux from one coil is gonna add on to the magnetic flux from the other coil to create the magnetic flux linkage. Think about it, coils of wire being linked together. That's the basic idea. So this follows a simple formula. Um, for magnetic flux, the, the link between magnetic flux and flux density is that the magnetic flux is the magnetic flux density multiplied by the cross section, the right angled cross sectional area. Okay, I always think of it as fiber because that's the Greek letter phi, so it's fiber. For magnetic flux linkage, it's actually phi ban because each magnetic flux for a coil of wire, for a coil of wire, it's going to add together each time it passes a coil. Okay, and that's why coiling up wires increases magnetic effects. That's the basic idea, okay? So, again, there's a relationship with angle. I've assumed that the coil of wire, imagine my hand is the plane of the coil of wire, I've always assumed it's at right angles. It's not always at right angles, but it follows the same rules as, we, as, it, as it does with Bill. If you think about it, if you change your area so that you've got your area here, Magnetic flux is still in this direction, and you end up with the fact that the component of that area in the di in perpendicular or right angles to the direction of the magnetic field, that component's gonna be smaller than when the field is at right angles, okay? You can see that that, com that vertical component there is gonna be smaller, and the more that angle increases, the smaller it is. So, it is phi band, phi equals ban theta, magnetic flux density times the area times the angle between the plane of the coil and the, uh, the magnetic flux, okay? So I cos theta in, in, the, in the case of this particular picture, because when theta is zero, that's at right angles, okay? Now, if you move, you probably know, know by now that if you move a wire through a magnetic field, so here the magnetic field is moving towards, is moving uh, away from you. If you move a wire in that magnetic field, you set up a voltage or, or an EMF. And that, that wire, that EMF is going to be related to, well, going back to high school physics, it'd be the strength of the magnet, okay? It would be the amount of the length of wire in the field. Well, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Because if you've got one piece of wire generating the EMF, it's in series with another piece of wire, make a longer piece of wire, You've got the EMF from this one plus the EMF from this one. You're going to induce a bigger EMF with bigger voltage. That's logical when you think about it. And you probably learned from years ago that if you move the wire more quickly through the magnetic field, you generate a larger EMF still. And that EMF can be then used to drive the current. When you're describing induction, think about EMF or voltage and then link it to current. Don't just go and jump straight to current. So you pass the wire through a magnetic field at right angles. Notice the direction of motion, the field and the wire are all at right angles to each other. Okay. Now Faraday's law says, the greater the change of magnetic flux, the greater the EMF. It basically says it's directly proportional. Well, that makes a lot of sense. If you think about the magnetic flux, that's gonna be, um, that's gonna be the flux density times the area. Now, if you uh, the area swept out, if you sweep out the area more quickly, i.e. by moving the wire through the magnetic field more quickly, that's going to generate twice the EMF if it's twice the speed. If, he, uh, if you have twice the strength of magnetic field, then you've got twice the magnetic flux being sort of swept out because the field lines are close together. So you're going through twice as many field lines, which means that you're going to have twice as much voltage. Logical, it's logical. Okay, so for example, an aeroplane is, is got a wingspan of 45 meters, uh, traveling at 950, traveling at 950 miles per hour. Okay, okay, kilometers per hour. That, um, 
in, in a magnetic field. We assume it's, it's all at uh, right angles. Now, here's your first taste of magnetic flux density. It's a really small number. If you have magnetic flux density of several Teslas or tens of Teslas or thousands of Teslas, with a few exceptions, like an MRI scanner, you've probably got something slightly wrong. Magnetic flux densities are usually measured in milli Teslas. So in this case, it's five times 10 to the power of minus five Teslas. And the airplane travels at right angles. It's gonna generate an EMF between its two wingtips. Okay, so let's work out what that EMF is. Well, we're looking at the idea it's gonna sweep out an area. So the best way to look at it is to go back to my demonstration page. Okay, and you've got 45 meter wing to, uh, wingspan, 950 kilometers per hour, uh, and five times 10 to the power minus five Teslas. Well, that's all very well and good, but that's clearly a bit of a nuisance. So let's just play with that for a minute. So 950 kilometers per hour, that's 9.5, times 10 to the power of five meters and an hour is 3,600, okay? So that's 950,000 divided by 3,600. Alexa, what is 950,000 divided by 3,600? 950,000 divided by 3,600 is 263.8889. Is much more useful. Now let's think about what's actually happening here. You've got your 45 meter wingspan. Now we're looking at the rate of change of magnetic flux. Almost all induction questions can boil down to this idea the magnetic flux, the rate of change of magnetic flux with respect to time is equal to the EMF. Okay. This works every single time because the magnetic flux. is BAM, okay, B-A-N, we're assuming it's all right angles. Now, the N is equal to one, so we can just get rid of that, it's just in the way. The area, well, the area is gonna be the distance traveled by the plane multiplied by the 45 meters. And the distance traveled by the plane is gonna be the speed times the time, okay? So, that's going to be the speed times the time multiplied by the, um, the, the, the wingspan, L. So if that's the case, then the EMF is going to be the rate of change of B times V, T, L over time. Well, actually, as it's constant speed, it's just going to be, we can get rid of that. And suddenly it becomes relatively simple to then um, to then simplify. Bevel. Now, magnetic flux density is five times ten to the minus five. The speed was two hundred and sixty-four, and the length was forty-five. So, Alexa, what is five times two hundred and sixty-four times forty-five? Five times 264 times 45 is 59,400. Okay, well, we simplify that to, to make a more sensible number. Well, that's going to be, that's 5.9 times 10 to the power of 4. So that's going to be 0 0.594 volts, about, about half a volt, okay? So that is how you would then work out the, um, work out the, the, uh, the, 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 the sort of the EMF induced. Here we looked at an aeroplane, it could be any, any, any sort of wire indeed. The point I want to make to you, and we've got one more point to make and then we'll, um, and then we'll wrap up I think, is that almost everything to do with induction boils down to that equation, Faraday's law, okay? It boils down to the idea that 
the rate of change of magnetic flux linkage is equal to the total EMF induced. Everything boils down to it. Whether you've got a changing magnetic field, in this case, in the case of the worked example we just did, the changing area, okay? You don't normally have a changing number of cores, that doesn't really make much, very much sense. But the changing, but these two, one of these two will always change whenever there is a, um, <clears throat> whenever there is a, uh, um, whenever there is an, an induced EMF. And that's how it works. So Faraday's law is brilliant. One last little point to make. I'm not, I'm not going to use the PowerPoint for, the, for this bit because I don't like using PowerPoint all the time. We think about it for a brief moment. If motion of a conductor through a magnetic field can generate a voltage, and obviously voltages drive There's currents. Lunch sitting. Students in non-practical classes right. should go for lunch and return in 45 minutes. If we're inducing a voltage which can drive a current, then we're creating electrical energy. This creates a problem because energy can't be created or destroyed. So work must be being done on that conductor moving through a magnetic field. Which means that there must be a resistive force because work is force times distance. And you're moving a conductor through a magnetic field. You're moving it in, uh, in this direction there must be a resistive force in the opposite direction. And that's the thing called Lenz's law. The idea that there is a force on any system inducing an EM, inducing a current, which is opposite, which opposes the change creating it. And that's quite important because otherwise we wouldn't be conserving energy. We'd be breaking the first law of thermodynamics, which we really don't want to be doing. So what we need to do now is remember that there is actually an opposing force. And there are a lot of applications you're going to come across when you do your holiday work. You're going to come across things like eddy currents, whereby if you have a conductor moving in a magnetic field, it moves a bit more slowly. Okay. Um, it's also, if you think about it, there's also a thing called superconductors. Superconductors have no electrical resistance whatsoever. So imagine my fist here is a superconductor. Imagine my hand here is the north pole of a magnet. If I move that superconductor close to the magnet, then the magnetic flux through the bottom of that superconductor is going to change. Changing magnetic flux induces an EMF, which, because it's a superconductor, drives a current. Now, it drives a very large current because it's a superconductor. Resistance is zero, so current is really high. As it produces that current, the direction of that current is such that it opposes the motion creating it. So the motion creating it would be if you take to that superconductor and you dropped it, so it starts to move downwards. It would create an eddy current, a circulating current in the bottom of that superconductor, which is in the right direction to oppose the magnetic field and therefore push it back up. And that's why you often see, if you go on YouTube and you search superconductor levitation or something like that, you'll see examples of it. And that's how it works. It works by this massive eddy current being produced, which then opposes the change as the superconductor moves towards it. Because one of the things they always show, they always show you the superconductor not wanting to move downwards, but very rarely will you ever get a demonstration which shows the superconductor being lifted up. But if it does, it lifts the semiconductor up with it. So that is how superconductor levitation works. It works by using a thing called Lenz's law, which creates a problem. If we have the current carrying wire in a magnetic field, we know that we can predict the direction of the thrust. Now, if we've got a current flowing through there and we've got a force along here, we've got to be, this current could be being produced by the motion, the same motion through, through the magnetic field. 
So if we've got a current flowing through that way, uh, sorry, flow, flowing that way, the magnetic field again going towards you, then the motion is downwards, but the force in the opposite direction. So if you move a current carrying wire downwards, you induce a current in this direction. The current in this direction through the same magnetic field is going to create a force which is upwards. So as you move a current carrying wire downwards through a magnetic field, it experiences a force upwards. And as you move the current carrying wire downwards, sorry, upwards, it experiences a force downwards. The confusing bit is because to predict the direction of the current, or sorry, of the force on a current carrying wire, we use the left hand rule. To predict the direction of current, uh, the direction of the current induced in a, in a conductor as it moves through a magnetic field, we have to use the right hand rule. Because the current being induced is always in the direction such that it, in, that such that it opposes the motion creating it. So I'm creating the motion, so I'm creating a current in a current carrying wire by moving it, say, upwards. And that current carrying wire in the same magnetic field, it's still towards you, okay, is in the opposite direction, it's downwards. And that's, that's something to remember. That's why people get very confused. That's why I would say Fleming's left hand rule is for motion in magnetic fields due to a current. It's how motors work, and you drive your motor on the left hand side of the road. And induction is the other one. Enjoy your holiday. Do the holiday work on magnetic fields and magnetic forces and we'll discuss it in the new year. Have a great holiday, everyone.